My message today is part two of uh, God's promises. Everybody say promises. Aren't you so glad that God's made promises? You know, one scholar uh, did a little discovery and and found out that there are over 8,000 promises in God's word. Those are for us today. God's promises still stand today. Amen? Um, Thinking about football, uh, I know that many of you have got some plans, and that's why you're here today, this morning, for the earlier services. We had quite a few at the 8 o'clock service as well. But uh, when uh, when my boys were growing up, um, they played football. Uh, they played a lot of sports, but um, a few years they played football. And I don't know if you have kids and they played football before, but it was a, I was a wreck watching them play football. You know, they had the pads and everything, and I think Jariah just loved to wear the pads. He, look, he loved the look of it, um, but he, he uh, broke his collarbone one year. And I'm just a wreck on the sidelines with all the rest of the parents out there you know, they're all screaming, but inside they're just full of anxiety. And, and my son, Jake, and my boys were thin. You know, they weren't, uh, they didn't have a lot of meat on them. And, and uh, the opposing team, you know, you look at the opposing team, and some of these boys were big boys. I'm like, there is no way you're eight years old. You're, you're in high school, kid, you know. I mean, you look at them like, you're going to destroy my boys, you know. I, I mean, I was one of those parents, and... Um, uh, I, I remember my, my son, was, he played football in, in high school for his uh, freshman and sophomore year, and uh, he was quarterback. And um, man, he, he loved playing quarterback, but the coach asked him as he was entering into his junior year, hey, you're going to play, right? And he said, no way. I'm not. And he told me, he said, Dad, I, I don't like getting hurt. <laughs> <laughs> My boys would come home with bruises all over their body, and he said, Dad, they do not have a strong offensive um, uh, uh, line, right? I mean, it, there's nobody to protect me, Dad. The center, he gets bulldozed every time, and they rush in, and, and they kill me. He said, I'm not going to do it. Let me say this, guys, as we go into today's message. How many of you know that without a good offensive line, Without a good right tackle or a left tackle, without that line, Jimmy G is not going to be able to pass very well to his wide receivers, right? Mahomes is not, and some of you are like, oh, don't even say the word. Hey, I'm wearing his jersey today because I like Kansas City. Yeah, and um, yeah, please, ushers, please escort. Listen, Mahomes is not going to be, if he doesn't have a good offensive line there, he's not going to be able to pass it to Tyreek Hill there in the end zone. And they are going to score a lot today. So let's watch for that. But how many of you know that there's something about being protected, right? When you feel protected, there's a certain kind of confidence that you have. Like, you could, you could do anything. When you know that there's a, there's a protection there in front of you. You know, most people here today, your job is not a, a dangerous job. Some of you in law enforcement, you may, you may be in dangerous situations. But for the most of us, we do not encounter dangerous situations on a regular basis. Yet so many of us in this room, we've got an adventurous spirit about us. Today we're talking about the promise of God's protection. If you have your Bible, you turn to Psalm 91. If you got it on your app, turn there or or click there. Psalm 91, we're going to do a little investigation into God's Word today. I love this chapter. We all love, those of you that are believers in Jesus, and you stand on this. I mean, this is exciting for you. You read Psalm 91, it's like so encouraging. It's like one of those staple for the Christian walk, you know, where we're always quoting it. But we love it because it declares who God is to us. Those that know God, it gives us this picture that, that God is so strong and so able. It, it, it shows us the magnitude of, of how much God really cares for us and wants to help us. The author of Psalm 91, he wanted his readers to know that because the Lord is his God, he protects him. He also wants the reader to know that if the Lord is their God, he will also protect them. 
Psalm 91 is divided into two sections. The first section is is verses 1 through 8, and the second uh, section is 9 through 16. And each part of those sections, it, it begins with something that is a prerequisite for God's protection. The question that needs to be asked this morning is this, as we dive into God's Word, is who qualifies for God's protection? Who gets to have God's protection? Look at verses 1 and then at verse 9. Verse 1, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. Look at verse 9, if you make the Most High your dwelling. So two times the psalmist states that God's protection, number one, is exclusive. It's exclusive. People read this, this wonderful psalm, and they, they claim God's protection over their lives, but really it doesn't benefit anyone except for those who dwell with God. Do you see that this morning? Those that dwell with God. And, and you, you may wonder, well, what does that mean, those that dwell with God? I, we kind of overlook that part of it because we think that we're all really included in, the, in, this, in this scripture, in this promise. But what does it mean to dwell with God? We know that God is in heaven, that he dwells there, but what, does it mean that we've got to be there in order for this to happen? Is, is the dwelling place a, 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 a certain location that he's talking about? The King James Version in, in verse number one, it says that this place is a secret place. Don't you love that? It's a secret place, like a, a, a secluded place. Michelle and I had the privilege when we were uh, celebrating our 20th anniversary, we're getting ready to celebrate 27 years, but uh, 20 years we went to Puerto Vallarta, Mexico. Anybody ever been to Puerto Vallarta, Mexico? Uh, it was great. I only got sick once, but it was great. And um, we, on one of the days, we took an excursion. We got on a, on a ship, a, a, a boat, and, and uh, a number of people, about 100. 50, 200 people got on this boat, and it, and it took us to this, like, island, and it was so cool. We got out, and the, the water was so crystal clear and so warm. I love to be in the water when it's warm like that, and the, the waves coming out in Hawaii, and, and the beaches were so beautiful. It was so awesome, and, and we were sitting there, and, and um, we were out in the water and coming back and, you know, sunbathing, and and all of a sudden, some guy that worked there, you know, had the uniform on, he came up and he said, excuse me, are you Mr. and Mrs. Hogue? Yeah. Well, I, I, I have something that I want to share with you. Um, you have been selected to, um, <laughs> to, to, to come with us. We, we want to treat you to this special place, a secluded place, just for the two of you to celebrate your anniversary, and everything is waiting there for you. And we look at each other like, I, th I think you've made a mistake. There, no. And, and now that I look back, I'm like, oh, my word, who is this guy? You know, they could have been kidnapping us. I'm like, oh, wow. But we went. We got in the golf cart. We got in the golf cart, and the whole time we're like, this is the weirdest thing in the world. They took us through like this, the back roads and, and up through the jungle area. And sure enough, there was this secluded cottage. It was the most beautiful cottage. It was an open-aired cottage. And inside of it was gorgeous. It had fresh flowers everywhere on the tables and, and just beautiful. They had chocolate-covered strawberries and fruit and, and drinks for us. I'm like, what is going on? This is the weirdest thing. We get out, and he says, we're going to pick you up in a couple of hours. Enjoy your time here, and uh, we're going to pick you up for the concert that everybody's going to meet, and we have a special place for you at the concert. We're like, who? what in the world? This is the weirdest thing that we've ever experienced. I want around i said this somebody is playing a joke on us or somebody's trying to kidnap us because i'm a i'm a look around i was searching for the hidden cameras you know i was looking in the in the uh, pictures on the wall i mean someone trying is filming us 
And this is weird. But it was so nice. It was secluded. It was secret. It was so quiet. And sure enough, two hours later, somebody comes by and picks us up and takes us to the front row of this concert. It was absolutely incredible. Listen, the title that the psalmist used here to describe God in verses number 1 and 9 gives us a clue as to where the secret place is, the secluded place of God. It's the place of the Most High, which suggests somewhere elevated, right? Out of harm's reach. And he's not talking about a physical place. He's not talking about a physical location. It's a figurative expression of a person who knows God well enough, who is so close to him. That's what it's talking about, he who dwells with him. In other words, divine protection, friends, it's not for everyone. Maybe even for those, not even for those who even claim to be Christians, who, who, who'd say that they're Christians. It's not for everyone. Charles Spurgeon, the famous English preacher, said this, Every child of God looks toward the secret place, yet all do not dwell there. They run to it at times and enjoy occasional approaches, but they do not habitually reside in his presence. God's protection is for those who remain in God's presence, who have a close, abiding relationship with him. Let me ask you today, do you have a close relationship with God? Is there an attachment that you have with God that you know that you know inside of your, your knower, in your heart, in your mind, that God is with you wherever you are, that you can talk to him, that he's, he's there when you sleep, he's there when you get up, he's there when you're driving, that there's communion that you have with him, that you know that he's your father, that you know that there, there, there's a, a security that you have knowing that he is with you. Listen, the truth is, is that we're all going to face circumstances, and perhaps you're in a circumstance today in a dangerous situation, something that has happened, that has transpired, that is perhaps beyond your control. Guys, it can be a scary place to be in that situation, whether it's an emotional situation or a physical situation, or perhaps it's a situation that involves your finances. Listen, the scripture gives us the promise of God that if you have a close relationship with God, if you have a deep attachment with him, you can have the confidence, right? The confidence in knowing and believing that there is extreme protection for you. These verses tell us what this protection is like. Again, the author uses figurative speech comparing divine protection with things that we are familiar with. In verses 3 and 4, look at, it, look at it. He compares it to the protection a mother bird offers to her young. It says, surely he will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers and under his wings you will find refuge. And in verses 4 and 6, he compares it to the protection a shield offers a soldier. It says, his faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. Guys, look at those verses a little bit closer. It's so strange that the description does not seem to match the figure. The common danger that both of them are list, that list here, it's, it's this word, it's pestilence. You know what pestilence is? It's like a contagious disease, like the bubonic plague or like the, the, the coronavirus. It's a horrible, horrible thing that spreads. Now, what's interesting here is that as you look at this, neither a bird nor a shield cannot protect against pestilence. Do you see that? So what is the psalmist saying here? There's something that he's trying to get across to us. 
The second point is this. God's protection is extensive. That means his protection covers a whole lot. Amen? God's protection goes beyond these figures. He obviously does more than what a bird can do for its young, more than what a shield can do for a soldier. His protection, listen to me, his protection knows no limits. It's like this. When somebody buys a refrigerator, okay, and I know maybe some of your appliances are, are going haywire and some of you are thinking about, you know, we've got to get a new washer and dryer, we've got to get a new refrigerator, whatever it might be. But let's say you, you get a refrigerator, a brand new refrigerator. It usually comes with some type of protection plan, right? It guarantees that it will operate just like it says that it will, right? Or, or the way that it's, it was advertised to you. And the warranty covers defects in workmanship, but it does not cover what? Regular wear and tear. Now, if you're moving a refrigerator, a new refrigerator, like what we did when we recently moved to our house about eight months ago, and you take your refrigerator and you're moving it, you get it in the truck, and you, you get it to the new location, and you try and shove it through the front door, and it doesn't seem to fit, but you decide to shove it anyways, <laughs> and it scrapes the whole front of the door, I don't know if you know that the warranty is not going to cover that. Listen, it has limitations. God's protection plan does not have limitations. It covers more than you expect. That means that you should never get so fearful, that you should never get so worried, so filled with anxiety when a problem comes, when an issue comes, when you get news about something. A believer that is strong, that is abiding, that is dwelling in the presence of the Lord, they should know no such terror in their life. Those that don't know God, that aren't attached to God, have you ever noticed that when bad news comes to them, their whole world falls apart? And isn't it amazing that when a believer, a strong believer gets word of something, yes, it shakes them a little bit, but they know what they're standing on. They know in whom they have believed. There's something different about the one who dwells with God they understand that his protection is limitless. The next two verses show us one of the most incredible resources that God has right at his fingertips. In verse number 11, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. And look at verse 12. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Here's the third point. God's protection is extraordinary. That means his protection has supernatural elements to it. God has the power to command. He has the power to summon angels to help those who dwell in him. Let me say this about angels, that angels are real. Can anybody say amen? Angels are real, but they are not for us to command. They're not for us to summon. They're not for us to, to call on the angels to come and do something for us. They are not to be treated like a pet. We're not to give them names, special names. We're not to command them to do things. We're not to pray to angels. We are to pray to Jesus Christ, amen? Only God has the power to summon angels and to command them to do what he desires. Friends, we are the recipients of God's authority. There are tons of scriptures that talk about angels coming to help those that are in need. And, and many of you know what I'm talking about. An angel protected Isaac when Abraham was about to sacrifice him. An angel protected the Israelites with, when the Egyptian forces were about to destroy them. A host of angels appeared and protected Elijah when the Armenian army tried to capture him. An angel protected King Hezekiah and the people of Jerusalem when the Assyrians besieged them. An angel protected Daniel and his friends when they were in Babylon. 
when they were about to be executed. Twelve legions of angels, that means about 144,000 angels, stood ready to protect Jesus when soldiers came to arrest him. Let me also point out this, that the psalmist says this about angels, that angels offer comprehens- constant, comprehensive protection. Look at verse number 11 again. His angels guard you in all your ways. Again, when you are dwelling with him. His angels stand guard in you in all of your ways. Now, that doesn't mean that you can always depend upon an angel in every circumstance that you are in. Remember when Jesus was being tempted by the devil in Matthew chapter 4, verse 6? It says this if you, on the screen. If you, this is Satan. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down. He was at the highest point of the temple. Throw yourself down, for it is written. Where? Right here, Psalm 91. He will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Twisting the scripture, using the scripture the wrong way. Jesus knew better. He knew that it was not the intent of that verse. Satan wanted Jesus to test God instead of trusting God. Verse number two, Psalm 91 says, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I what? Whom I trust. Friends, we are called to trust God, not to test God. The only place that we are called to test God is in the area of our finances that's mentioned in Malachi. That's the only place that we are called to test him. We are called to trust him no matter what no matter what life throws at you, no matter what issues come your way. But if we deliberately, listen, if we deliberately choose to put ourselves in harm, in, in, in danger, you may actually forfeit God's protection over your life. God wants you to trust him, not test him. Last, in the, these last three verses, God himself speaks, and here's what he says. In verse 14, he says, because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. And then he lays out the way that he does it. And he adds, and I, this is what I love about God. Whenever God gives us a promise, a blessing, he goes well beyond the blessing. He overflows it. We learned about that last week. He overflows It's just not the simple protection that he's offering. Look what it says in verse 15. He will call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Here's our last point. God's protection is expansive. It's expansive. This means that God will give us lots and lots of benefits when it comes to his protection. These scriptures tell us that the one who makes a decision to dwell with God, God will answer that person whenever he calls upon him. That's an incredible thought, that the God of the universe is ready, that he's not too busy to, to answer you when you call. That's awesome to think about. You know when you call somebody to to help you do something, what what, what do they often say? They often say, well, let me check my schedule. Let me look at my calendar, especially when it comes to moving, right? Hey, can you help me move? Um, Hold on a second. Let me check my calendar. (whistles) Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm not available during that time. That's not the way it is with God. God is ready for action. That whoever calls upon him, he will answer him. The second thing that God says is that he will be there when the believer is in trouble, in the midst of trouble. That's in 15 as well. I will be with him in trouble. That means that God's going to be with you in the midst of the mess. Whatever you're going through, whatever it is, whatever the heartache, whatever the accident, whatever it is, the promise is that he will be with you in the trouble. 
He's not on the outskirts of the trouble. He's in it with you in the trouble. And then he continues again, verse 15, I will deliver him and honor him. What's so awesome about God is that he isn't just satisfied with the promise of protection. It says that he's going to do more, that he's going to deliver, more than deliver us, he says he will honor us. And I love the Hebrew word for this because it's so cool. It means to be heavy. It means to be weighted. This, this word that he'll honor us, be weighted. It, there's a sense here that God continues to do good things, that he weights us. He's weighing us down with his favor. And so many of you know what I'm talking about today because so many of you walk with God. You dwell with God. You know what it means to to receive the benefits and the favor of the Lord. You know that there's so much more than just God's protection and delivering you. You know that God is your source, the one who supports you, the one that encourages you, the one that gives you direction, the one that teaches you, the one that strengthens you, and so much, much more. God is so very generous. And many of you that, that walk with God, you know exactly what I'm talking about. This last verse in this chapter, verse 16 says, with long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. The promise of long life. I mean, that's what everybody's hoping for, that I'll have a long, satisfied life, right? Does this mean an eternal life, or does it mean here on earth? Oftentimes when it's talking about long life in the Old Testament, it is referring to life here on earth, the long life, the satisfying life, the content life here on earth. Let me tell you this, that the longer that you dwell with God here on this earth, the longer that you are in communion with him, the longer that you call out to him, the longer that you claim him as your best friend and you walk with him, The closer you get to him, the greater your contentment will be. The greater your peace will be. As we come to a close, we're going to share in communion. And and communion is a time for believers. It's a time for those that that know Jesus. And, And I know some of us are like, well, I don't know if I'm really dwelling with God. I don't know if I'm the worship team is coming now. And and we're going to sing a song in just a moment. But some of you are like, I do I have a real relationship with God? Is it deep? Do I have that attachment with him? And and many of you know the answer to it. And and here's the deal, guys. If you want to have a deep, real relationship with God, the starting point is Jesus. That's where it starts. The Bible tells us that no one can come to God the Father without coming to Jesus first. Jesus, the most powerful name the most wonderful name, the most incredible name. It's Jesus. It's the starting point to recognize that we are sin, sinners, that we've got issues, that we've messed up, that we're not perfect, that we need someone who can cleanse us, someone who can take the sin from us because with sin in our lives, we cannot approach God. We can't dwell with God. Because God and sin don't mix, just like oil and water. They will never mix. Sin cannot be with God. So sin has to be taken care of. And there's no amount of you doing good works or, or saying certain prayers or, or going to, to church or reading your Bible enough. The only solution to our sin problem is Jesus. Because when Jesus died on the cross... He took our penalty of sin. He took care of our sin. All your issues, all your stuff, all your junk, all your guilt, all your shame, all the stuff that you did last night and the week before, he took care of it all and all the stuff in the future as well. That's what Jesus did. Jesus died and he rose again, proving that he had power over death and the grave and over sin. And he's asking us today, because he's here right now, and he's asking us, do you want to have a relationship with me? Do you want to have a real life? Do you want to have a new life? A 
life that is full of contentment, a life that is full of purpose and passion. That's the kind of life that he offers us. He says, I'll take your junk. I'll do an exchange with you. You give me your stuff, your junk, and I'm going to give you mine, which is so much better than yours. It's beautiful. God takes our dirty rags, and he gives us new life in him. That's the beauty of who Jesus is. But that's the starting point. You want to dwell with him? It starts with Jesus. Ushers, would you come and let's receive today the, the, the emblems, the, the elements today. And again, th there's two elements here. And go ahead and pass them out. And we're going we're gonna to eat together. So hold on to them until everybody's been served. But there's nothing magical about communion. It's specifically ordained by Jesus himself. Jesus says, this is what I want you to do. I want you to take this to remember me to remember what happened at Calvary, the way that I died, the way that I rose again, that this is the basis of your life. This is the basis of salvation. This is the starting point. No, don't you ever forget it. And he says, as often as you do this, you remember him until he comes again. And in the meantime, we receive all the promises of God. They are yes and amen, the Bible says. I'm going to read the appropriate scriptures in just a moment, but I'm going to ask the worship team to, to lead us in that song about how wonderful and powerful the name of Jesus is. And as we sing this together, will you concentrate and will you talk to God? Will you go to him where he is? The Bible says that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. The Bible says draw near to him, walk toward him, and he will walk towards you. He will draw close to you. So it's your choice, your option. You come to God, God's going to come to you. Ask him to forgive you of your sin in this moment. Reflect upon how incredible he is, how incredible his love is. And let's ask him for forgiveness today. And let's renew our relationship, our deep relationship with him. Amen.